Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another meeting discussing the beautiful life of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And last time we talked about the arrival of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Medina and the first things that he did sallallahu alayhi wa sallam including the construction of the masjid and how the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam participated in this construction. Now we are at the beginning of establishing the first state for Islam, the first uh, uh, nation for the Muslims after they have been they have been persecuted for 13 years now they have a home of course we let's not forget about another group of Muslims who have been in exile for a while now for almost eight years now in Habasha and surprisingly enough the Prophet وسلم, did not call for them to come back and join him in Medina at that time yet since the arrival in Medina, the Prophet ﷺ started seeing some of the obstacles that are going to materialize later on. We mentioned that one of the first things that he did ﷺ upon arriving in Medina was uh, giving the uh, good faith to the, uh, the people who are living in Medina in general, particularly the Jewish tribes that were living there, Bani Qaynuqa, Bani Nadir, and Bani Quraida, and how the Prophet ﷺ signed with them a treaty of mutual defense. So if Medina is attacked, both groups, the Muslims and the Jews, all the three tribes, are going to join hands in defending Medina against any external aggression. The Jews in, in Medina knew about the Prophet ﷺ, and there's a very beautiful story about one of them uh, who was uh, a young man, a very knowledgeable man who comes from a very knowledgeable family. So he was a teacher, the son of a teacher, or a rabbi, the son of a rabbi, to the Jews. He says that one day I was working on top of a, a palm tree and my aunt was sitting below that palm tree and I heard about the arrival of the Prophet ﷺ. And I used to read in the books and I knew that we were about to expect the arrival of that Prophet, the last Prophet, the last messenger. We find his description in our books and we find the place where he's going to migrate, which is basically al Madinah al-Munawwara. So when he heard about the arrival, uh, arrival of the Prophet وسلم, he made takbir loudly when he was on top of that palm tree. His aunt heard him and he, she, she said, that's so weird. If you had heard about the arrival of Musa ibn Imran, Sayyidina Musa ala Nabina alayhi salatu wasalam, you wouldn't be even more pleased. And he said, he is the brother of Musa ibn Imran. So his aunt asked him, is that true? And he said, yes, we find him in our books. And he started basically informing her about the Prophet ﷺ. So she said, if that's the case, that would be great. And then he went to uh, greet the Prophet ﷺ. And just to confirm that this is the one, first of all, as soon as he saw him, he saw that this is the face of a nice person, a kind person. He said, this is not the face of an imposter. This is not the face of a liar, someone who claims to receive revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he doesn't. He is an authentic one. And then he started asking the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about a few questions and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, I do have the answers to these questions. They were basically three questions and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I do have the answer to these three questions and Jibreel told me about that answer. So Abdullah ibn Salam said, Jibreel, this is the enemy of the Jews. The Jews basically, even within the angels, they claim to have their allies and their enemies. So they said, Israfil is our friend and Jibreel is our enemy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala later on in the Quran says, basically whoever declares that his enmity to Jibreel, then he is an enemy to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Jibreel is an angel of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His message or his responsibility is only to deliver the message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the prophets and messengers on the face of this earth. So he acts only upon commandments from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not out of his mind. Therefore, whoever declares enmity to Jibreel is an enemy to the one who sent Jibreel alayhi salam, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet وسلم, answered these three questions. And Abdullah ibn Salam told him, now, now let me tell you something about these Jewish tribes here. I know them more than you do. I am one of them. First of all, he declared his Islam 
and acknowledged the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I know my people. They are very arrogant and they are very stubborn. And sometimes even they would know the truth, but they would hide it or deny it. This is their practice. I am one of them and I know. But I have great hope that upon hearing about you and upon seeing you because they have been expecting you for so long, so maybe when they see you face to face, they are going to follow you and declare their Islam. And he told the Prophet wasallam, what I would like you to do is invite a group of uh, the leaders of the Jews and let me hide in a room behind you. And then ask them about me and see what they're going to say. And then if they acknowledge me that I'm a knowledgeable person and I'm one of their leaders, I'm going to come out and I'm going to declare my Islam. Maybe at that time they're going to follow me and they would become Muslims as well. The Prophet wasallam said, that's fine. So when that group of leaders came and they started talking to the Prophet wasallam back and forth, ultimately the Prophet wasallam said, what do you say about Abdullah ibn Salam? And they said, oh, this is our scholar, the son of our scholar. He's a great person. He's a leader. We follow him. We believe him. We trust him. So the Prophet wasallam asked them, what if Abdullah ibn Salam becomes a Muslim? And they said, A'udhu Billah, that would never happen. We, we don't think that's going to happen ever. And then Abdullah ibn Salam came out of his hiding and he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. Suddenly you can see the full transformation of the faces of these leaders. The expectation of Abdullah ibn Salam was they're going to change from their faith to the new faith following the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But their response was, they said, he's a liar, he's an ignorant, he's the son of an ignorant. He comes from one of our worst houses. We do not trust him, we do not like him, we do not follow him. And Abdul, Abdullah ibn Salam looked at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and that's exactly what I was expecting. And they left and went away from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that was one of the first meetings or confrontations between the, Pro the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Jewish leaders of Medina. Now, Sayyidah Safiyya bint Huyay ibn Akhtab radiallahu anha, Ummul Mu'min, Sayyidah Safiyya radiallahu anha, later on to become the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she narrates a story. She says, when I was young, I was the most beloved child to my parents. My father, Huyay ibn Akhtab, who was a leader, he loved me so much. So I used to come to his meetings and his gatherings every now and then. And she said that one day, my uncle, Abu Yasser, came to him. And he told him, I heard about the arrival of that man who came from Mecca, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Have you heard about him? He said, yes, I have. And he said, do you recognize him? And he said, I do. Is he the one that we have in our books? He is. Can you authenticate his description and his narrative? I can. So what are you going to do? Look, look at this discussion, very logical discussion so far. So the purpose of Abu Yasir was to confirm that the Prophet wasallam is the expected Prophet. And he confirmed that from his older brother, the leader, Huyay ibn Akhtab, who was knowledgeable. So the next question was from Abu Yasir to his brother. So what are you going to do? The logical sequence to the answer would be, he is the last prophet. We find him in, his bo in our books. I have confirmed that he's the one. I should follow him. But his response was, I am going to be his enemy for as long as I live. Where is that coming from? It is coming from arrogance. All that time, these Jewish tribes were thinking that the new prophet that's going to come we will, will come from the offspring of Sayyidina Ishaq, ala nabina alayhi salatu wasalam, the sign of Sayyidina Ibrahim, ala nabina alayhi salatu wasalam, as all the prophets before the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasalam came. So all of them, with the exception of Sayyidina Ismail, of course, alayhi salatu wasalam, all of them came from the offspring of Sayyidina Ishaq, ala nabina alayhi salatu wasalam. So when it came from the other branch, the branch of Sayyidina Ismail they rejected. They did not want to acknowledge that. 
because that's going to deprive them from their, the continuation of their lineage and their heritage. So he comes from our cousins. We are not going to acknowledge him. Abu Yasser kept telling him, my brother, listen to me. Just listen to me in this one and disobey me in everything else. Since you recognize that this is the prophet and we know in our books what is going to happen to his enemies, please obey me, follow me and follow him. Accept him, embrace him as the prophet and the messenger. And if you want to do anything else to disobey me, do, but just obey me in this one. But Huyay ibn Akhtab insisted on his enmity to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in fact, until the day he died. He kept inciting hatred and inciting violence and inciting rebellion against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, preparing plots, conspiring with the enemies of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam until the day he died. Now we are in Medina, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has built the masjid has established the center of the community, the companions, the Muhajireen and the Ansar, the Prophet ﷺ has formed these brotherhoods among them. So now the community, mashallah, is so strong. What is left now is to add the mortar that's going to bind all of these beautiful bricks in the building of Islam. And that binding agent was the Quran that was revealed to the Messenger and the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the ahadith and the practice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we mentioned last time that when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was migrating from Mecca to Medina, some ayat from the Quran was, were revealed, including the ayat in Surah Al-Hajj, أُذِنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتَلُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا which is the first declaration now that the believers, since they are moving from a land of oppression and aggression to a land of supremacy and, and a land of peace, now they have the right to retaliate. They are not going to stand idle while their enemies attack them and harass them. They have now the right to retaliate and to bear arms. The second ayah that we mentioned also was the promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that one day you will return back to this land that kicked you, kicked you out, Mecca al-Mukarramah, so now let's look at the Qur'an that started being revealed to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina. In the past episodes, we have been talking about the Qur'an revealed to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Mecca, especially at the very beginning of the da'wah, at the very beginning of the message of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the ayat were short, concise. The suwar were short and concise. And they were addressing matters of faith. They were addressing the senses, the, the, the sight, the hearing, the, the smelling, the feeling, the intellect. It was urging people on whom these ayat were revealed to walk around, to look around, to look at the natural phenomena, to look at the sun, to look at the moon, to look at the skies, to look at the, the animals around them, the, the camels, to look at uh, water, to look at everything around them and tie all of these things that there's got to be a creator who has created all of these things. They're not being run by themselves. They did not create themselves or perpetuate themselves. Now, in, since for 13 years, that Quran was establishing the foundations of faith in the hearts of the believers. And then gradually, as the years started passing, the ayat started getting a little bit longer. And the ayat started addressing the the, the arguments of Quraysh against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and against his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refuted all of their arguments and responded to, their, to all their questions and, and their worries in suwar, a long surah like Surah Al-An'am, for example, which is a surah Makkiyah, that it, it's a relatively long surah and it addresses many of the questions that Quraysh came with to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam inquiring about Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, inquiring about the message, inquiring about Islam. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is describing himself, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, in Surah Al-An'am to anyone who wants to know why is that Lord worthy of being worshipped. And then when we look at the Quran that is revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina, 
Now the Prophet وسلم, is assuming multiple roles, not only the role of the spiritual guide, the Prophet and the Messenger, but also he's assuming the role of the head of state. And here we, we should draw some comparisons between the Prophet وسلم, and previous Prophets and Messengers prior to him وسلم. When we look at Sayyidina Isa ala Nabina والسلام, he received the revelation, some people say, at the age of 30, although he spoke in his, uh, when he was a baby, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him to, but people say that he received the revelation at the age of 30, and he started delivering it at the age of 30, and he was raised to the heavens at the age of 33, so his message, alayhi salatu wasalam, was about three years. Sayyidina Isa was not a, uh, he was a leader of a community of believers, of course, but he was not, um, a, a head of state. He did not have a state. The Prophet وسلم, was a prophet and a messenger and a head of state. When we look at Sayyidina Musa, وسلم, he also was a prophet and a messenger. He managed to take his people and free them out of emancipation, uh, out of, of, uh, of uh, slavery. He emancipated them. He, he take, took them out of slavery in Egypt and they moved towards the promised land in Palestine. But we know the story about how his people rebelled against him and they refused to get into that land, claiming that strong and giant people are ruling, ruling it. The ayat that were given to us in Surah Al-Ma'idah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing that uh, story, how Sayyidina Musa ala Nabina alayhi salatu wasalam, upon approaching that city, he, he saw that it's a very strong and fortified city. Some people say it was the city of Jericho or uh, Ariha, which is not too far from Al-Quds, Jerusalem. And Sayyidina Musa commanded his people to get into that city. And they rejected. So what he did was, initially he said, we're going to send some spies to assess the situation and see how strong that city is and if there are any gaps, any weak points where we can penetrate. So he chose from every tribe, from the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, which are basically uh, the, the brothers of Sayyidina Yusuf and Sayyidina Yusuf himself, the 12 sons of Sayyidina Yaqub, ala nabina alayhi salatu wasalam. From each tribe, he, he chose a leader. And he told these 12 leaders, go and assess the situation and come back with the news. Tell me what you see and give me your assessment. So these 12 leaders went walked around, assessed, looked at the city, and came back with a majority message. Ten of the twelve said, there's no way. The city is too strong, it's too fortified, it's well defended, we cannot penetrate it, and the people who are there are so strong, well armed, we are not going to be able to defeat them. So ten of the twelve came with this negative message, but two said, we can with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all we have to do is the first effort. All we have to do is force our way through one of the gates of that city. Once we do that, victory will come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us this whole story in the Quran. Now these two leaders who came with the positive message, they were Sayyidina Yusha ibn Nun, Joshua, the right hand assistant of Sayyidina Musa ala Nabina alayhi salatu wasalam. And the second one was Caleb ibn Yufunna, again another companion of Sayyidina Musa ala Nabina alayhi salatu wasalam. And it's quite interesting that today these two names are very common names. Joshua and Caleb. You hear these names quite a lot, especially uh, uh, all around us. But when you hear about the names of the other ten delegates, the 10 leaders who came back with the negative message, their names are known, but no one cares to name his children following these 10 people because their, their contribution was negative. So Sayyidina Musa ala Nabina alayhi salatu wasalam, when they tried after these people rejected to get into the promised land, Sayyidina Musa complained to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, Oh Allah, I only can control myself and my brother Harun ala Nabina alayhi salatu wasalam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, then this land is forbidden for these people. 
For 40 years, they're going to be lost in the desert. During these 40 years, Sayyidina Musa Ali Nabina alayhi salatu wasalam passed away. And then one of these two leaders, Yusha ibn Nun, Joshua radiallahu anhu or alayhi salam, he led his people after all of that old generation had perished during that loss in the desert. Now a new generation came that did not know about the weakness of their fathers. They are ready to fight with Joshua and they forced their way through that city. But Sayyidina Musa ala Nabina alayhi salatu wasalam did not have the chance to be the head of that state. Looking at other prophets and messengers, Sayyidina Ibrahim was not a head of state. Sayyidina Nuh was not a head of state. Sayyidina Lut, Sayyidina Shu'aib, Sayyidina Salih. Maybe the exceptions to that rule, prophets who were heads of state were Sayyidina Dawood ala Nabina alayhi salatu wasalam and Sayyidina Sulaiman ala Nabina alayhi salatu wasalam. Two great prophets, two great messengers who were also heads of state. Now the Prophet ﷺ had a different responsibility because each one of these great prophets and messengers was responsible for his nation, his group at that particular location, at that particular time. But as we know, the message of the Prophet ﷺ is eternal, it is universal, it is not limited by space or time. Therefore, the Prophet ﷺ has to establish very strong and deep foundations for that state, the state that is supposed to continue until the end of time. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among the followers of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa and to keep strengthening the foundations and the structure of that state without weakening it. And until next time, inshallah, where we continue talking about the efforts of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, establishing this nation. So until next time, inshallah. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته